Next, here's a depiction of a layered computer model. The big idea of this model is that we can think of a computer as being comprised of various distinct layers. Each layer only knows about or interacts with the immediate adjacent layers. The four layers shown here are the hardware layer, the operating system layer, the application layer, and then ultimately, of course, the user layer. At the bottom of the stack is the hardware layer, which for our purposes can simply be thought of as the microprocessor. It only understands binary ones and zeros, but ultimately it's the computing engine which carries out all programmed instructions. Sitting right above the hardware layer is the operating system layer, or OS. Its role is to isolate the user, or any applications, from the details of the hardware layer. Its job is to provide standard interfaces for all services some application may require. Some examples of operating systems you're probably familiar with are Windows, Mac OS, various flavors of Linux or Unix, and mobile device OS's such as iOS or Android. An operating system provides a stable foundation upon which any number of applications can be run. For us, when we refer to applications, we really mean any software applications that a computer may run. For the purposes of doing Java development, this is the layer we will most concern ourselves with. Generally speaking, applications shouldn't know or care about the underlying hardware specifics. All they should really know about is the underlying OS. And then finally, of course, at the top of the heap is the user. In general, a user really shouldn't care about the underlying hardware or OS. The only thing a user will interact with is whatever application they're trying to run. Not that it really matters greatly to us from an application standpoint, but these are some of the typical roles of an OS. An OS boots and runs continuously, controls access to various computer devices, it allocates memory and allows multiple applications to share the CPU, and it keeps applications from colliding with one another while executing. Again, we won't be too directly concerned with these roles, but they're listed here for the sake of completeness. Next, we want to take a look at the memory model, and this is one of the models which we'll keep coming back to. For the purposes of understanding how programs work in memory, we can think of computer memory as being a long list of individual storage cells. If you've ever been in a post office and seen the long banks of post office boxes, this is exactly the same idea. Every one of the cells represents one location in computer memory and has a unique memory address. The contents of those memory addresses are nothing but ones and zeros. So as we see here in the picture, on the left are the ordered individual memory addresses represented in hexadecimal and on the right are the ones and zeros which live at each of those specific memory addresses. So what do these ones and zeros really represent? Every piece of data in a computer's memory must be one of two possible things, program instructions and program data. And in their raw form as pure ones and zeros, without having any other context to go on, it's impossible to tell the difference between the two. For example, Take a look at the ones and zeros here in memory address 3. Does this represent a number? Is it an instruction? Is it part of a video or, or of a JPEG? Without having any additional context, we have absolutely no way of telling what these ones and zeros represent in isolation. They could mean absolutely anything. Just as a refresher, we know that memory storage is in terms of bits or binary digits. A bit can only be a 1 or a 0, and bits are typically grouped by 8s into bytes, so one byte is typically 8 bits. Storage capacity in computers is aggregated into immense byte quantities using the various byte prefixes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and so forth, and each of those quantities is a successively larger power of 2, as shown here, both as exact and approximate quantities. Now here's a programming model that we're going to see over and over again as we progress in this course. So let's make sure we've got a pretty clear understanding of this one. 
This is the black box model, and we'll be using this frequently to develop Java methods. For programming purposes, we will commonly collect a series of related Java statements into software containers called methods. Methods represent actions we take upon some program inputs. We provide a set of inputs, some actions are taken upon those inputs, and some sort of output results from those actions. From a software development standpoint, the details of those actions may or may not be known to us. If we are implementing such a method, then of course we know all the internal details. But if we are simply using such a method, as we'll first be doing with classes, we neither know nor care about the internal details. As long as this process yields the correct results in a timely, repeatable fashion, we can focus our attention on what happens rather than how it happens. The interfaces here are simply the left and the right boundaries between the inputs and the outputs. If we can first clearly specify what the inputs are going to be and what we expect the outputs to be, then the actual internal software implementation follows pretty nicely and we can focus on those details. Let's take a look at an example of this. In this example, Suppose we want the sine of an angle. Maybe we know the angle x in degrees and we want the sine of that angle. So we need to somehow implement the details of this sine function. Maybe we haven't decided yet on how we're going to do that. Are we going to use a trig table lookup? A Google search? Are we going to use some flying monkeys in an abacus? Right now we don't know and don't care. All we want to do now is set up the interface or the shell to this function and we'll fill in the details later. So here we see what the interface that corresponds to this diagram might look like. Let's say that the name of our function is going to be called calculate sign. The input will be this value in parentheses a double precision number we'll just call x. The output value we want to calculate will be another double precision value called sine of x as we see here. And this piece of code is enough for now to get us started. We'll figure this out and fill in the details later. But by abstracting this function as a black box as shown here, we can nail down the inputs and the outputs, set up the software shell, and fill in the details later. We'll use this approach extensively later in the course as we develop some new Java classes. Finally, we want to briefly touch on the idea of the Unified Modeling Language, or UML. UML is a general purpose modeling language often used in software engineering, and it's been around since the mid-1990s. There are about 15 or so UML diagram types, but a full treatment of UML is way beyond the scope of this course. However, there is one specific UML diagram that we will use in this course to show the structure of software classes, and that is the UML class diagram. Let's take a look at it. Turns out that we've actually already seen the UML class diagram, although we never specifically identified it as such. But in a couple of our first lectures, we saw these diagrams on the right. Then in a recent lab exercise, we saw similar depictions when we refactored our Hello World program into a Hello class. UML class diagrams are used to represent the structure of Java classes in a standard way. Remember that we said that a Java class was the blueprint or template for some real world thing. And it consisted of two things, data and operations upon that data. Here on the right, we see the Lego block class example we considered, where we had data such as color or shape or size, and operations such as assemble or take apart. As we see here in this diagram, the UML class diagram has three distinct sections. At the top is a narrow section containing the name of the class. Below it, in the middle section, is the data for the class. Later on, we'll refer to these as instance variables of the class, or what the class is. Below the data, at the bottom, are the operations for the class, which we'll later refer to as its methods, or what the class does. As we move forward in Java, 
Notice that we'll start referring to things by their formal terms, or these terms shown in bold font. I've also shown things in their more casual or layman's terms so that we can better make the transition in our terminology. So keep these various software models in your mind as we move forward in the class because we'll see these abstractions again and again. And with that, we'll conclude this lecture segment.